direction that our country and our world are going in. And after more than 20 years and recent events, I am more concerned than ever. Accordingly, I have decided to be silent no more and through a sequence of YouTube videos to share the information I have learned. I hope you find these to be informative and helpful. Thank you. It started out just, just a letter and gradually as time went by, we were getting more letters on um, different regulations that were coming down the pike um, and it got to the point where it was um, almost like we were being assaulted. We have spent the last two years, instead of enjoying our ranch and building on our ranch, we've spent it going to meetings and hearings and um, developing strategies to try to help the farmers. At, at one point we finally realized that we might not be able to keep this beautiful ranch. I'm sorry. I thought, I thought we were doing something that was American. And so begins today's story, the fight to save rural America in Siskiyou County. The issue is that government wants to remove four hydroelectric dams on the Klamath River. The positive impacts are debatable, the negative impacts are clear, and the impact to communities and people apparently don't matter. We begin with a little background information. The river is located in Northern California and Southern Oregon. The circle here is around Wairika, California. The river flows from the upper Klamath Lake in Southern Oregon across Northern California into the Pacific Ocean. The word Klamath comes from the native Indian American term for stinky. The Klamath River Basin covers two states, nine counties, five in California, four in Oregon, and covers an area that's large, larger than the state of Maryland. We take a look at the beginning of the river, which is the upper Klamath Lake in Southern Oregon. It's a shallow and warm lake sitting on volcanic rock, which makes it quite rich in phosphates and other minerals. The warm water and the phosphates make it ideal for farming. Unfortunately, this also makes it ideal for the growth of blue-green algae, which at times turns the water green. The dams are located here, and the volume of water in the river at this point is 1,860 cubic hectometers. As we flow down the river, we notice that we have a change into a more mountainous region, and the river becomes colder and clearer, and the volume of water has now increased to 7,280. At this junction, we have a large supply of water coming from the Trinity River, which itself is 4,610 cubic hectometers, and by the time the water reaches the ocean, we have a total of 15,440. As the water flows then from the source to the destination, we see that the water quality actually improves. It becomes cooler, colder, clearer. The warm temperatures and the cloudy water make the upper part of this poor habitat for spawning salmon. The ideal habitat is within an area of 20 to 20 miles, 10, 12 to 20 miles of the coast, which is about 85% of the hab habitat for the spawning salmon. The story to complete the picture is that the Trinity River water has been diverted and pumped over the mountains to flow into Southern California, some 81%. That reduces the total flow of the cold, clear mountain water that comes from the Trinity River to 876 cubic hectometers. We return back to the dams now. The three dams that are in California, the lowest and closest to the ocean is Iron Gate, and upstream are Copco 1 and Copco 2. We notice here at the lower gate, Iron Gate, we actually see that there's a fish hatchery. This is Copco 2, and this is the reservoir that's built up behind Copco 1. And the fourth dam is the John C. Boyle in Oregon. It's 224 miles upstream and was built in 1962. The dams produced hydroelectric power, enough to supply the needs of 70,000 homes. Hydroelectric power is absolutely clean and completely carbon footprint free. It's renewable, it's local, it's very low cost, and it's also flexible and one of the major means that you use to balance the line loads on our electric system. 
In addition, the dams serve the function of water regulation. They prevent flood during the rainy seasons and they prevent drought during the warm seasons. Additional benefits include a healthy ecosystem. They support the wildlife and give them a source of water and they provide recreation. The plan is to blow up all four of these dams. The fish that's involved, the argument is that the coho salmon is an endangered species, is an adronomous fish, which means that it basically is born in the fresh waters of the mountains and swims down and then lives most of its life in the ocean. And at the end of its life, it returns upstream to spawn. It's one of several salmon, and in fact, it's the less desirable because of its flavor. But as far as a species that provides much, they don't. The Chinook salmon, also called the king salmon, is called king for a reason. It's the predominant commercial fish, and it's the one that most people associate when they buy their salmon for food or for dinner. The salmon, including the coho, have a very extensive range. As far away as Japan, Russia, Alaska, California coast. It's also been successfully planted in the reservoirs throughout the United States and including the Great Lakes. It's a cold water fish. It prefers water that's 36 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit and at temperatures above 61 degrees begins to die. County is a huge county. It's the size of Massachusetts. It's four million acres, in excess of four million acres. It's fifth largest county in California. Uh, more than 60 percent or 25 million acres are managed by the U.S. Forest Service or the state. We have uh, 44,000 uh, people living here and the economic profile is pretty dismal. Unemployment in Siskiyou County was 8.9 percent three years ago. It's now over 20 percent. Um, Siskiyou County is last in all of the California counties in family economic well-being and 14 percent and 19 percent of the population live below the poverty line. 27 percent of the children live in official poverty. 78 percent of, of our property tax is kept by the state. With this background we're in a better position to understand the debate. The first question, is the coho actually threatened? Government's position is it's a threatened species. But the residents say that's not true. To understand, we understand that the government, when they use the term threatened species, most of us assume that species is going to go extinct. But this is really not the case as we've seen in the earlier map. In fact, what the definition means is in the particular area where the fish is native, government believes that there are too few, and in the process, they do not count the fish that are spawned in the hatchery. The residents respond that this idea that the coho is threatened is misleading. Again, we see that they are, have an extensive range and are placed throughout reservoirs in the United States and the Great Lakes. In addition, the criteria is the fish must be native. The residents respond, it is not a native fish. Coho salmon were really not indigenous to the climate of the basin at all. In 2001, on December 27th, the Karuk Tribal Council meeting indicated that there were never coho salmon in this river and why the hell should they try to bring them back. The absence of data supporting the coho salmon indicates that the state of California's listing of the Endangered Species Act and National Marine Fisheries Service enlisting coho is unlawful arbitrary and capricious. Next, the government contends they're too few, but the residents respond, they've always been too few. This historically has been a low count. In 1925, 1925, 295 silver salmon made it to the Klamathon County Station. August 5th of 1919, the catch of king salmon was 521 fish, 521 fish. 2,272 fish in 1920 not the millions and millions and millions and millions of fish that Fish and Game would have you believe come up this river every single year. And finally, the government does not count the hatchery fish, which means they do not count 78% of the fish that are actually hatched up in this area. 
the coho are today a successful fish. The, the, uh, the hatchery is only required to produce 50,000 of them a year. The next issue that's raised by government is the question of what's the problem. The government has concluded that the dams and agriculture are the problem. The residents respond that the problems are natural and historic. It's not the dams. If we take a look back at our information about this area, we find out that the water quality is simply poor at this part of the river, and that is historically true and is fundamental to the way the system works. In addition, we can take a look at an aerial view of Kapu Lake, and we can see that the water is coming in, comes in fairly green, and by the time it goes to the end of the reservoir near the dam, we can see, notice we see a clearing of that and a cooling and a deepening of the water. Second, the argument is it's not agriculture. Agriculture only accounts for 5% of the use of the river volume. If you release millions and millions of fish and less than 2% of them come back, I don't know, I'm not a scientist, but I suggest that the problem might be elsewhere. So we take a look at the cycle. You can see other problems. In the adolescence, the fish that are raised in the hatchery actually have their maxillary bones removed, a source of potential infection and a reason perhaps they are underweight in the ocean. The maxillary is, as I say, a bony, thin, oh, right on the, the, what would be the upper lip of the fish. These fins are all clipped for rapid identification. The maxillary is clipped with, uh, as a matter of fact, I think they use fingernail clippers. The, uh, not the little ones, but the kind that look something like pliers. And they get slided in under the maxillary all the way to the rear where it's actually attached and clipped right there. Next, there's a known infection zone in the river right where the Shasta River, just below where the Shasta River enters into the Klamath River. And one belief is that this is due to silt that was released when the government agencies begin to remove the check dams along the Shasta River. After they started taking these dams out, 100% of steelhead, chinook, and coho fingerlings were infected. Next is a question of steelhead predation. It turns out of the number of salmon produced by the hatchery, a half a million of the steelheads had actually held back for another six months for growth before they're released into the river. And they feast upon the coho fingerlings that are smaller in size. Next, we take a look at what happens to the salmon in the ocean. There is a phenomenon that's happening, which is a warming of the ocean off the coast of California and Oregon and Washington. Since the coho salmon don't like the warm water, they simply go north up to the Gulf of Alaska. The data in support of this is that in 1950, there was 149,000 metric tons of salmon caught, 80% of which was caught in the Alaska Gulf. By 2008, the amount had actually more than doubled, almost tripled, to 402,000 metric tons, but now 97% of the salmon were caught in the Gulf of Alaska leaving only 3%. So the salmon are clearly growing and more populous in nature, but the amount that's being caught off the Pacific coast is reducing. The causes for the warming include the El Nino of 1983 to 1985 were very detrimental to the salmon during that period of time and their hatching, general volcanic activity and earthquakes as well. In addition, there's the fishing itself, the commercial fishing which has now gotten very scientific with these huge drift nets and Russian trawlers that are in fact catching an increasingly larger amount of the fish. Now we can take a look at the problems that occur on the journey home. First is seal predation. They eat the salmon. They like the salmon. It's natural for them. The seals were listed in 1978 as an endangered species. Since that time, the seals and the sea lions have increased in population by 19 times, and so has their appetite for salmon. Next, the fishing done by the Native American Indians has now become very scientific, also adopting drift nets, spanning across the rivers in a Z pattern. 
Their fishing is basically unregulated by government agency. And all the, deliberates, the limits are established, there's no one to check that that is what is being met. Next, we have early releases of water from the Trinity River. In order to produce enough water for a certain Indian celebration in the river, they will actually increase the flow of the water two or three times. They do this earlier than the spawning season. This release of cold, high volume water encourages the waiting salmon to now come up river thinking that the river and the, the fall season has begun the rains and they're fooled. They come up finding instead warm and relatively dirty water. In addition, the estuaries have silt that's built up over the years. And the hatchery itself has certain quotas. When it gets enough row to produce the number of coho salmon that it wants, it kills the remaining coho salmon rather than them into the streams where they can grow and hatch in the, in the wild. Next is the question whether dam removal is the solution. Government's position it is. The residents say there are far better options. So the response is fix the real problems, such as those with the problems with the fish going downstream, out in the ocean, the commercial fishing, as well as the problems that are below the dam. We can improve the habitat, the estuaries down there as well. Second is to build on what's there. One proposal was to go ahead and build fish ladders so the salmon could in fact bypass the dams without taking out the dams. The cost was estimated at $300 million. The answer was no. Not only was the cost considered to be too high, but it did not end the lawsuits that the environmental groups would take against the dam operators. A simple fix, we could reprioritize. The hatchery today produces six and a quarter million salmon per year. 75,000 of those are coho, Six million are kings, the remainder are steelhead. It's a simple matter for the hatchery to double the coho to 150,000 a year. And this, this doubling can be achieved by a simple 1% reduction in the kings. That's not even considered. Another alternative is a fish passageway. There is Bogus Creek right below the dam that flows from across in the east-west direction. Survey indicates that a tunnel could be built of 4.7 miles long, which would have sufficient guards for the fish and resting places and light to allow them to move upstream and downstream, again without removing the dams. The estimated cost was only $50 million, or one-sixth the cost of fish ladder. The response? This option is not being considered. There's another proposal built on an idea that's more than 50 years old, which is the Klamath Shasta Import Project. It still uses the bypass tunnel around the dams, and it uses an existing water right that's not been utilized, but exists. And the idea is to take the phosphor-rich warm water during the winter months when we have an excess, move that down into the valley, and store it for usage in the summer. Then the replacement water would be made up with the water that's currently being used for farming. It would be the cold and clear mountain stream water instead of being used for agriculture, we go back into the river to make up the difference. This is not being considered. It really becomes a simple question. A tremendous amount of money has gone into the building of these dams in the current system, all of which was sponsored by the government agencies as a form of progress. But now we're at an inflection point, a decision point. The agencies have concluded that they were wrong, and that the fact that dams are a problem and they need to remove them, what they call a system of restoration, which is really in terms that we would understand the destruction and to spend a whole lot more money to destruct, destroy the progress that has been made. The residents on the other hand say, let's build on the progress that's there and let's continue the improvements. Let's not take out what we've already done. Then the question is, well, if dam removal is not the solution, is it even a solution at all? The government says, of course, that it is, and the residents, including the PhDs, disagree. First, to discuss whether dams are an improvement. They are. My name is Rex Casalio. I'm one of four generations living in, on, and with the Klamath River. We're one of the few people that actually live in the hot spot directly below Iron Gate Dam. Uh, before and after. 
and uh, can personally say since the dam has gone in, while we've had several major floods exceeding so, uh, many from prior to the dam, we have never had the damage to the environment, to the sedimentation, to the uh, erosion for the river and riparian area that we had prior to Iron Gate going in. Personally speaking, there's absolutely no question that the water quality, the riparian stability, uh, the fishery habitat, and even the temperature, which they argue with, is far better since Iron Gate was put into place than it, is, uh, than it was prior to that. The system is in better shape today than it's ever been. In fact, knowledgeable residents conclude that not only it might not be beneficial to the salmon, but it might be a possible devastation. First is the obvious fact that the hatchery will be destroyed. So the six plus million salmon that are produced will no, be no more. These are already responsible for 78% of the coho returns. We're talking about six million kings, 200,000 steelhead, and 75,000 coho will all be gone. Returns of drought in the summer. If the dams were removed, these wouldn't provide the water that they did historically. Jenny Creek has been diverted to a great extent into the Rogue Valley, and Fall Creek is being used primarily for water for the city of Wairika. Severe drought, four consecutive years, this could result in little or no spawning, and four years will see the demise of the salmon. We've had a fraction of the damage uh, that has occurred since Iron Gate went in. When the dams go out, you're going to wipe out a large part of, of the habitation downriver uh, for sure. In addition, there will be a release of the sediment that's been building up behind these dams for nearly 100 years. The uh, first reservoir was built in 1918, so this 21, 20 plus cubic million yards of sediments uh, will be washed down the river uh, as the dams are removed. It will take years and maybe up to 100 years before these sediments will be released down the river. And during that period, the river will be contaminated. In addition, that would create an enlarged infection zone. And we already have the results from the infection zone that the smaller one that's already there. So if you extend the, the uh, infectious zone, you never will have anything. In addition, the lakes actually serve as a filtering process. In fact, the water quality will decline precipitously without the dams. And finally, the warm water fish that are in the reservoir, many of them would die, but the yellow perch are expected to be able to live quite well in the river and potential contenders to the salmon. In summary? They're not helping anything. They're not doing anything good for anybody. They're going to end up destroying the salmon. There have been three studies already, and all studies agree that the destruction of the dams will also destroy the river. It will destroy the spawning beds. I feel that there has been more speculation than there has been science. I am not at all sure that in this case the conclusion didn't come first and the facts are now being manipulated to fit the conclusion. Next to the question, are coho the only thing that really matters? The government position is yes. They're a quote, threatened species, and therefore everything else is subordinate. The residents, on the other hand, look at the consequences to their community, to their lives. I'm a retired Siskiyou County Superintendent of Schools, and I have seen the decline in Siskiyou County of every aspect of life. Everything that impacts people has been threatened by some federal ordinance or agency. And all these things have an impact on families and particularly the younger children. Siskiyou County has traditionally been an economically depressed areas, area. And with the loss of agriculture due to dam removal, uh, we have absolutely no economy left. This is the real message. Siskiyou County is the seventh poorest county in California, and we're on our way to become number one.
My name is Danielle Lindler and I'm a registered professional forester and a pest control advisor. If you own timberland in this state and you want to uh, harvest, you have to hire somebody with my license, like I said. We go out, we do all this paperwork, and then we have to submit the document to the Department of Forestry. It is then reviewed by Mines and Geology, Water Quality, Fishing Game, and the state archaeologist, just to name a few. And then if you have federal endangered species, it's um, reviewed by the Federal Fish and Wildlife Service. What the problem is, is it becomes so costly and cumbersome that the landowner, small landowners especially, can no longer afford to harvest trees. Now we have to have 1,600 permits. Now we need an erosion control plan to get a waste discharge permit. Now we need smoke management plans to be able to burn wood waste. Um, so now you're dealing with the air quality board. Um, I think there's about four or five permits that we deal with now, where before you only used to have one. And that's just on private land. Federal land is a completely different issue. They're under NEPA, which is the National Environmental Policy Act. And they, their issue is they're so hamstrung with environmental lawsuit that they're not able to harvest. And we don't understand the agenda of the environmentalists. Foresters and other land managers are the true under true environmentalists so why not harvest timber in our backyard my name is mike adams i am a suction dredge miner what we do is very benign to the uh, environment and in fact in many regards is very helpful the bottom of this river is basically cemented in place when we mine we basically suck up the gravel out of the river that goes up a 20-foot pipe goes across a four-foot sluice and then is immediately redeposited in the in the river in a clean, loose deposit, uh, which is excellent, excellent fi uh, fish spawning habitat. Two years ago, uh, there was a court order ordering the California Fishing Game to. Uh, complete a new environmental impact statement and they have been doing so for the la about the last two years. We're just about to the end of that period and uh, recently the California legislature uh, passed another law which added an additional five-year moratorium. A two-year moratorium has uh, adversely affected my income greatly since that was the way uh, I primarily derive my income and uh, an additional five years will absolutely cripple me. They keep outlawing what I do legally. And then there's the loss of the hydroelectric power itself, which we've already discussed. And this will be placed with what? Whatever the energy source is, it'll be a much higher cost and it'll have a much larger carbon footprint. I bought this property in 2000. The whole concept here was to build a legacy for my grandkids. If we take these dams out, in spite of what is being um, generated by the Department of Interior, this will be a flood zone. Uh, all 2,000 foot of my frontage property here will go back into flood zone. The area where I'm sitting right now will be flooded as well as the rest of the park. Who wants to buy? a piece of property sitting on a mud hole. I came here in 1980. Uh, we could not quite make a living around here, so I lived on the road and traveled in order to be able to stay here. We built our house here, and uh, it was just the greatest place in the world. That's why we made so much of an effort to be able to stay. Uh, there's no way to tell you anybody about the value of what we have lost because uh, the living here is what we are going to lose. When they destroy our homes here, we, we don't care about compensation. There's no way you can compensate us for what we're going to lose. There goes the clean water. The experience in the Gold Ray Dam that's been removed is that what left, after the silt is released into the river, is chromium-6. When they take out the dams, what's going to happen to all the wells that are around the lake? That's our safe drinking water that we've got, and it's great. Now, in the past two years, they have removed two dams just over the border in Oregon, and they're still trying to figure out what to do with it. 
the last dam that they just took out, the sediment behind it is supplying chromium-6. They don't even know what it is except that it's bad and they got to find a way to get rid of it and they can't find a way right now. All they do is filter it out and wash it downstream. So that's a lot of good. And finally, to top all of this, is they're going to be looking to the community to pay a large portion of the cost. The next question of major concern to the residents is, don't they matter? The government apparently doesn't think so, but the, per the people certainly do. If we take a look, government is constructed for two purposes. One is to set policy, and second is to enforce that policy. In our form of government, that is done. The people give those powers to government on the, ba the basis that there is representation, accountability, and proper jurisdiction. And according to that system, we then have states, counties, and city governments. Okay, with that is legislation. In 1905, the federal government authorized these dams. The dams began to go in with Copco in 1920, and in 1970. Uh, 1757, there was a Klamath Basin Compact, an agreement how the water would be used and the priority was for agriculture. That compact is still in place. But something began to change with the 1973 Endangered Species Act. And it really began to take stride in 2001, when simple administrators of these agencies declare the sucker fish is listed. Over 1,200 people lost their farms in this area due to that alone. In 2005, the coho was listed, and we'll talk about this in more detail. There's the Klamath Basin Agreement, where the decisions are now be made by certain, quote, stakeholders, and the Interior Secretary authorizes this. What happens then is that policy is being moved over to the Klamath based on restoration agreement and the people and the stakeholders, thus ending the representation of the people, the accountability of their government agents, because now these decisions are being made by people who are not elected, not accountable, and frankly don't have jurisdiction. In addition, all this legislation no longer matters, only the Endangered Species Act. As a result, the government itself is being completely crippled and the idea of a representative democracy is being overthrown. The Klamath Basin Restoration Agreement involves again an area the size of Maryland, or even larger. It is an agreement among individuals they are called, or entities they are called, so-called stakeholders. They can be grouped into government agencies, certain tribes that are outside of the affected area, not in Siskiyou County, not in the, where the dam's located, various water districts, a few of the water users up in Klamath area, but not most, and environmentalists that don't even live in the area. To give some sense of how this agreement is coming together, for example, the agreement will allow $80 million to flow to the tribes once the farm, all this land is recovered as wilderness area. It's basically a subsidy, a handout. Excluded from the process of the people themselves that actually are on these lands and their state, county, and city legislatures. Once this agreement goes into place, it now becomes the law and further decisions become made by the stakeholders, no longer by our governmental processes. But the people will pay. So the question is, is who are the true stakeholders? The people who want to remove the dams that don't live there, or the people who live there and would end up paying their consequences, both in terms of money and consequences on their lives? The people were left out of the equation. Agencies refused to sit and coordinate with Siskiyou County. My name is Louise Gliotto, and I'm not originally here from Siskiyou County. I'm a newbie. I came here from the Bay Area. My brother talked me into moving here. Um, he told me that I could retire early, sell my house in the Bay Area, and move up to Siskiyou County because I could afford to live here. My thoughts were, in my retirement, was to do gardening and genealogy. I've done none of those things since I've been up here. I found myself saving dams 
No one's ever asked people in Siskiyou County if they wanted the dams in or out. It was, this was all decided by a group of people, 26 people, in fact, who called themselves stakeholders, who had secret meetings for two years. But I volunteered to be the chairwoman for, the, um, for Measure G. I'd never done anything like this before in my life. Measure G, when we were able to get it on the ballot, would en enable the people of Siskiyou County to have a voice. The vote was 79% of Siskiyou County voted to keep the dams in. Finally, the people of Siskiyou County had a voice. When the people were given the chance to express their opinion, the results were unambiguous. Finally, the question really revolves around the same questions that were in the founding of our country. Does government really know best? Of course, government believes that it does. But the people, on the other hand, say this is not the premise behind our country. The people who work on the land, live on the land, and have done so for decades and for many generations no best. We're good people. We work hard. We love this land and we want to take care of Before. it. They are led to believe that we're just raping and pillaging the land and that we are not stewards of the land. When in fact we're the only stewards of the land. We're the people who take care of the land. We take care of the animals on it, we take care of the water, we take care of the soil because we know that's what's going to create a livelihood and a life for everyone. That's how people are going to eat. And uh, we love our ranch and we love that life and I'm so frightened they'll be taken away. We, we in agriculture, love what we do. Why, would, why else would we suffer this abuse? They view the land, they view the land as, as an integral part of their lives in, in most of Europe. I mean, they, they raise cattle in, in, on buildings that are two and three stories high. I mean, they're all contained uh, in, in the building. They don't have, they don't have pasture. They're, they're, they're fed in the building, and, and, the, and they're on a, one block, and, and, and they'll have 500 animals in, in, in there. It's, it's uh, inhumane. I mean, if you want to really get technical about it, uh, the way that, that uh, we raise cattle, cattle specifically, because that's what I do, is, 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 is the most humane, natural way that uh, this is how an animal is designed to live in the open space so that it can, so that it can roam, so it can pick the food that's best suited for it. It's certain is it's going to cost a lot of money. In 2020 dollars, it is estimated that the cost of removing these four dams would run in the realm of three billion dollars. It's hypothetical whether removing the dams will have any effect at all on the rehabilitation for coho salmon. I am in agreement with all the science reports that, that we don't understand, and this is too big an experiment. And it's very bothersome to agriculture to understand and read these just a brief uh, indications about the, um, uh, the expert panels having real serious concerns about pulling these dams out, and then the government saying maybe we should do it anyway and we'll, we'll see how it works. They have no consequence of the decisions and no assurance of the benefit to the environment that we know they will not provide. They assume no consequence of those decisions. And there will be no going back. To summarize, government proposes to increase spawning of the coho salmon 250 plus miles upstream in poor water by destroying the dam, the hatchery, the current ecosystem, power production, agriculture, the community, property values, and an issue yet we have not discussed, that is the destruction of the Shasta Nation's historical rights to their lands. Restore drought, restore flooding, release 20 million plus cubic yards of silt into the river as long, along with the yellow perch at a cost of potentially billions of dollars to be paid for by the community and all Californians. Ignore the alternatives for fish that is not threatened, not native, and of little commercial value, with no guarantees, no liability, and no clear rehabilitation plan by agency decree with no representation of the people, no legislative process, no jurisdiction, and then call it restoration. The dam is only one of many issues. We go now into the remaining assaults upon the rural people of our nation. First is the battle over water rights, which we've already discussed. Next, the land grabs. In this red zone up here in Northern California, 
there is a designation called a monument. Monument in this case is millions of acres. Once you get the monument designation, it means no more humans. The regulations are really crippling us. It's getting tougher for a farmer to make it. We have been in constant meetings and negotiation with the department. The multiple layers of overlying agencies at the state level that don't seem to communicate with themselves and ask us different things about our same issues. For example, one issue would be that they want us to leave water for the fish and then the other one doesn't want us because it's not clean enough. So we have, without getting into all the acronyms, the North Coast Water Control Board, the Fish and Game, the Department of Water Resources, all these agencies that don't know what they really want us to do to be like all one package. We're trying to work separately with each one of them that can't work together. In our particular area, those, those mandates are going to probably break our backs financially. I know personally what it means to, to be put out of business, not only once but twice. Uh, and, and this has been done uh, because of the structure that we have, the, 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 the uh, actions of the agencies, and I might say improper, illegal actions of the agencies. Soaring fees and fines. Their new water master fee schedule. We pay $13,000 a year for the last, I don't know how many years, five or six since our last raise, and this year we just got the bill for $109,000. So from $13,000 to $109,000, that's putting all of us farmers out of business. And here, Jim and Preston Harris show us a diverter. These are put on the property by the agencies to divert the fish so that they do not end up in the irrigation systems on the farms. The water into the property flows in, the screen keeps the fish on the riverside and puts them back into the river while the remaining water goes on the property. These diverters are installed without the permission of the landowners and are maintained by the agencies without notification of when they'll be visiting. Nonetheless, should a little coho fingling die in one of these, the fine is $25,000 per fish. Four little fish that die in there would be $100,000. That would be the ranch. And a couple ounces each, we're talking about a quarter million dollars a pound for coho salmon. These are abusive prices for fish that you can go into downtown Wairika and buy at the grocery store and taxed by environmentalists. And the environmental community just keeps coming after us over and over with new issues, wanting our same resources that we need to make our ranches viable. When they don't win by political process, lawsuits. There are more issues. The question, why? I don't understand why. Why? Who would do, want to do this? Why they would do this? Why would our government do this to us? We have people here that want to live here and want to stay here and want to work here. And so why is this county dying? We are hardworking, dedicated people. Our whole nation is under fire from regulations, over-regulations, unpredictable regulations. We don't understand what is going on, what is going to be accomplished by all these regulations, and why this is happening to our United States. I got involved in this, and then the more I investigated and found out, I thought, well, why would anyone want to do something like this? Why would they want to destroy ranching here and farming? Uh, this doesn't make any sense to me. I began to investigate, and what I found out is a big, huge conspiracy. This is not a theory, it's a big, huge conspiracy. It's called Agenda 21. There is a plan to remove dams across the entire nation, and here is one accounting somewhat aged, accomplishing 836 dam removals as of that date. The Wildlands Project is a very well-funded effort to lock up as much as 50% of the United States in the wilderness. It is heavily promoted by most environmental, non-governmental organizations. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, 
helped create it in the mid-1980s to be the foundation of the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, which the IUCN wrote in 1982. The IUCN is an international group of over 1,000 NGO and government members. The founding members of Sovereignty International exposed this unbelievable plan in 1994 by obtaining incriminating evidence from the IUCN and giving it, along with this map, to the U.S. Senate an hour before the treaty was scheduled for ratification on September 29, 1994. Senate members were so shocked by this information and the map that the treaty was withdrawn and was never ratified. Nonetheless, tens of millions of dollars are being spent annually to implement it piecemeal without the treaty. With so much money to spend on implementation, it is on the fast track to completion. Animations in this presentation illustrate the progress made to date and what is being planned for the near future. The Wildlands Project is made up of three components, core reserves, interconnecting corridors, and a graduated buffer zone. More specifically, the core wildland reserves are no human use wilderness areas that only allow limited hiking and perhaps some fishing. The interconnecting corridors are wilderness links between the wildland core reserves. The buffer zones are designed to protect the wildland attributes of the reserves and corridors. Buffers allow only very limited use near the reserves and corridors and more use further away. Although preposterous to most Americans, federal, state, and non-governmental organizations are gradually implementing the strategy by calling it a host of innocent sounding names, gap analysis, open space, conservation areas, conservation easements, linkages, greenways, and many more. The first step in creating the Wildlands Project in the early 1990s was a thorough review of all existing government land for inclusion into the project. Most people are unaware that the federal government already owns 31 percent of all land in America. States and local government own another 9 percent for a total of 40 percent owned by the government. The second step in creating the Wildlands Project in the early 1990s was to identify all protected land and identify specific areas that can be converted into wilderness. Existing wilderness areas automatically qualified. The Clinton administration then launched two programs, the Federal Gap Analysis and the Roadless Initiative. The gap analysis is a cooperative effort between federal and state agencies to classify all federal and state lands into four classes, from fully protected to no protection. The purpose is to identify gaps in ecosystem protection that need to be corrected by land acquisition programs. The roadless initiative identified all Forest Service lands for inclusion into wildlands that have no roads or have recently closed roads. The third step is to lobby Congress to make federal national parks and wildlife refuges more restrictive, thereby qualifying for wildland status. States also have created protected lands that can be included as wildlands. The best known of these are the Adirondack State Park in upstate New York, the New Jersey Pinelands, and the Florida Forever and Natural Areas programs. If we take a look at the map and change its colors, we can begin to understand the impact even a little bit better. Anything that's dark is going to be controlled by government. The black areas will be completely void of people. And the darker green areas will be strictly controlled with very little human interaction in those areas. The only areas that will be for normal use are those that are shown in the light green. And as we can see, there are relatively few of those. Siskiyou County and the entire Klamath River Basin are in the crosshairs of this plan. It is a United Nations initiative which has not been ratified by the United States. It's moving forward anyway. It radically changes land use and control. It has complete national impact as well as global impact and certainly has impact on Siskiyou County. So why Siskiyou County? Well, the reason is we've become the post that we, that we have become the poster child is because we're very small in terms of population. We don't carry much weight politically, and we're a relatively poor county. So they picked on us with this national program they want to implement across the United States. If they can win here, it will set a precedent to take over every other part of the country with the federal control. And why should everyone care? For many, many years fed half the world and the reason why it fed half the world is because it had developed the greatest agricultural community that the world has ever known. Right? Now the last 15 years we've had to import food. If the, basically the ranchers and farms are shut down, 
How will this affect the American people? How would it affect American people? It would, it would uh, mean that the American people's population would have to be reduced. What would happen to the quality of the food supply of the United States if we had it imported all from developing nations? Well, it would be, it would it would deteriorate greatly because the the, the safety standards in in the American food supply are the greatest in the world. What would happen to national security if our country were dependent on food from, say, communist China or India? Uh, we wouldn't have any national security. We would be at risk. You have no national security if you're dependent upon another country for your, your necessities. America does matter to everyone. It's a source of our food. And in fact, it's the source of the best food in the world. It's also the source of our energy. Our oil, which gives us the freedom to do what we want, live where we want, work where we want, eat where we want, shop where we want, travel when we want, visit family whenever we want. It's the source of our jobs and our industry and our prosperity. It's the source of our water. It's also the source of our shelter, the lumber, the concrete, the steel. Our minerals. and indeed our national security. It's a question of self-reliance or dependency. In fact, rural America is the nation's backbone. That 95% of our country that we take for granted, that we drive through as we go from city to city, is in fact the nation's true national treasury. We have been blessed by our natural resources, and we take them for granted. But these are the hard-working people in our land that bring these to us, and they are under attack. We either stand together or we fall apart. Urban America must stand and join with its brothers and sisters in the rural areas to help them to defend against everything that's happening to them. We have to work hard, and we're, and we're not afraid to work hard. We take care of ourselves, we're responsible people, and we need help to get ourselves back on our feet. The next steps, go to the website Defend Rural America and join. Join with the rural people in their fight. If you're interested in knowing the bigger picture, even beyond that, and who's behind all of these things, go to silentnomorepublications.com and watch the YouTube videos why you're in so much debt. And also go to YouTube the user silent, more, silent No More Pubs, and watch How to Take Our Country Back, Part 1 and Part 2. To the people of Siskiyou County, I want to thank you for the time that you gave me generously during my trip to make this video possible, and I hope it does service to your cause. Thank you. This video is available on DVD. If you'd like to purchase a copy, please go to www.silentnomorepublications.com.